Hello guys, so we are now in Seoul in Korea during Korea Blockchain Week and here with you Anna Tutova, co-founder of Coins Telegram and our guest Ed Falcon who is uh, co-founder and chief scientist of Opchain Lab, uh, the company uh, developer and researcher uh, behind Arbitrum layer 2 Ethereum solution. And uh, as well, he is an uh, ex uh, yes, deputy uh, CTO of White House. Great to have you here, Ed. It's good to be here. So can you tell us how uh, about your background and how did you uh, get into crypto from the government position? Sure. Well, I started out as an academic. At, uh, I was a professor at Princeton University. And I started studying uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technologies back in 2011 or 12. Oh, wow. That's yes. quite Yes, yeah, so I've been working on it for a long time, and um, I got interested in 2014 in smart contracts and was really excited about smart contracts as a technology, but then um, the question was, uh, how can you make them scale? And so that led to a whole line of research with a bunch of students, and eventually um, what came out of that was Arbitrum. So first is an academic research project, and then we uh, started a company and started to build a commercial version. So we started the company in 2018, and then have been building since then. Uh, what was the primary purpose of uh, uh, the Arbitrum? What type of uh, use cases uh, did yeah. you see at the time? So we were really, our thesis at the beginning, which I think has turned out to be true, is that uh, gas prices and capacity would become a pain point for Ethereum users, right? Ethereum is great in many ways, but uh, gas prices are kind of painful. And so we were looking for a way to build a chain that was compatible with Ethereum, but would be cheaper, lower, much lower cost, and also have more capacity. And now you have as well quite a lot of updates and releases. Yes, like you yeah. recently launched uh, Arbitrum Stylus uh, testnet, which allows sure. developers to uh, build from different languages, yeah. Rust, C, C++. Can you tell more about this? Sure, yeah. Stylus is really, is sort of a unification of different models, different ways of producing smart contracts, mm -hmm. right? Previously, you could build in the EVM world for Ethereum and other Ethereum-like chains, and then you had to use specialized programming languages like uh, Solidity and Viper and so on. Or on some other chains, you could build using uh, more common programming languages, um, but then the two kind of didn't fit together. And what Stylus does is it really unifies the two mm -hmm. so that you have an EVM chain that's fully backward compatible with Ethereum but you can also write smart contracts in these other languages you mentioned, like Rust, C++, and so on, and run them together on the same chain, and they interoperate, you get full composability, so that really there's a, a, a smooth and seamless interaction between these. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. Yeah, that makes the inference for the developers much easier. And yeah. so how many languages do you currently support? Well, in principle, we can support any language that compiles to WASM, to WebAssembly. Um, so that's most of the popular languages. Uh, the one that has the most best built-out SDK right now, the best tools that uh, go along with that, is Rust. Um, and so Rust is sort of the primary one that we support the most now. C++ is coming soon. And, uh, and we'll see what else uh, uh, people build. That sounds great. And uh, as well, another uh, talk you have a lot uh, about fraud proofs. And yes. You launched as well in August a uh, bounded uh, uh, liquidity delay mm -hmm. vault. Uh, so, can you tell more about what sure. it is and what it means? For sure, you? yeah. So, you know, Arbitrum has had fraud proofs from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and we've iterated some uh, over time on the fraud proof protocol to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, every version has been super efficient in the happy case where. There's not a dispute. But basically what Bold is, is it's a new way of resolving disagreements among the validator set about what is the correct evolution of the chain. Um, and the big plus that you get from Bold compared to, as far as we know, every other fraud proof system in the world, it, uh, is that you get a guarantee that any disagreement can be resolved within a fixed amount of time regardless of how many different people there are making how many different claims. And also that the cost of resolving the dispute is a lot lower uh, than in any other uh, dispute protocol we know of. So Bold has been through 
uh, security audit at this point, and mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's on the path toward being ready for mainnet. Mm -hmm. So, how much is its use now? So currently, it is it's bold is not in use yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we but have. Is it in testnet already, or not yet? It'll be in testnet soon. Um, we've released the, we've opened the code and published a security audit from Trail of Bits of the Bold protocol and code, uh, and we expect to be launching a testnet soon. Mm -hmm. And as well, probably everybody like the, uh, the most popular uh, optimistic uh, two rollups are uh, you Arbitrum and yep. Optimism. So can you uh, tell more about the differences and the advantages? Sure. Yeah, I think. Arbitrum has a few advantages. Um, Arbitrum has the largest community, the largest set of users and um, deployed applications. Um, Arbitrum also, one of the really big advantages goes to security or s decentralization, and namely that Arbitrum has fraud proofs. Um, instead of having to rely on a multi-sig for, um, uh, to decide what's the correct outcome of the chain. Um, along a bunch of different dimensions of decentralization, we think Arbitrum is, uh, is more advanced. Uh, if you go to a place like L2Beat, which is a, um, which is a well-respected neutral site that gives kind of evaluations of different layer twos, uh, you can compare there and see uh, sort of what what they say. Mm -hmm. And what other security features do you plan to implement in the future? So uh, Bold, which you know we spoke about a minute ago, is one example. Mm -hmm. um, what that will do is it will allow it will, it will make it safe to have validation be permissionless. Mm -hmm. So, and this is really powerful as a security feature because in the Arbitrum protocol, uh, the guarantee is that any one honest validator can force the correct result to be confirmed, to recognized, right? And so if any one honest validator can force the correct result, and if anyone, you can be a validator, that means that everyone in the world has the power by themselves to force the correct outcome no matter what anybody else does. So that's a big step forward and that will happen when Bold is, that will be safe to do when Bold is deployed. Yes, yeah. uh, that's quite interesting. And uh, we are in currently in the bear market, so what can yeah. you tell from on-chain activity, like what's happening and yeah. what's your expectations when we'll see the market movements? Yeah, I'm not gonna try to predict the markets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone can. Um, the market has its moods and the mood will shift and it uh, and will be in a uh, in a bull market again at some point um, you know right now I think like us a lot of people are focusing on building building capacity building functionality so that first of all you know if you build well and if you you know support your community well you can still do well and have some growth even in this market but of course you know when the market turns and we get to a bull market, then you really, those who have been steadily building and improving during the bear market will be in, will be in the best position. Uh, what type of applications are currently being built on Arbitrum? Uh, where do you see the biggest interest? Are yeah. these mostly DeFi projects or do you have any gaming projects built on Arbitrum? Sure. Um, DeFi has been the biggest. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'll see that shifting. DeFi, the DeFi sector is more mature than some others. Um, I think gaming will be very important going forward. And, um, and that's partly because the changes in the underlying technology um, and the cost structure has gotten to the point where it's more, uh, it's more realistic to put more interesting games on chain, right? In order, you need a certain the, the best gaming experiences can come when you can do more computation on chain to have mm -hmm. sort of more of the richness of the game on chain and also where the transaction costs are low enough that it doesn't warp the game design, mm -hmm. right? So that users can do transactions routinely without having to worry too much about the cost. So I think we're getting to that inflection point mm -hmm. where different types of games um, are become possible on chain. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that'll be, a, that'll be one of the biggest growth areas. Um, maybe you can share some projects uh, on the, in Arbitrum ecosystem which excite you the most? Um, <laughs> the most exciting ones I think are ones that are still uh, in stealth mode. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm, and 
I guess I hesitate to call out particular ones. I'm really, I think one of the strengths of Arbitrum is uh, certainly in the DeFi space, the range of different applications and the way they, they fit together. We've been pretty careful along the way, and it's part of sort of our philosophy to not try to pick winners, mm -hmm. um, but instead to try to build a platform that uh, everyone can come in and compete on. And Zala, I assume you plan as well to release your layer three solution yes. for the gaming side. Can you tell more about this? Sure. Yeah, so this is what we call Arbitrum Orbit. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, allows anyone to come and launch a layer three chain that settles to the, uh, uh, to the main Arbitrum layer two chains. And um, so that's fully permissionless. Anyone can do that. Um, and there's a lot of interest in doing it. Um, and there have been a few announcements in this space. Um, a gaming chain called Psy, XAI. Mm -hmm. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, as well as uh, Caldera, which is a roll up as a service mm -hmm. provider, um, they've announced that they have um, five or six um, uh, orbit chains um, currently on testnet working with them. Uh, and there's more, there's more coming. Actually, my, but maybe my favorite orbit chain uh, currently is the, is the Stylus testnet, yeah. which, is also, which is also deployed as an orbit chain. And uh, well, uh, do you work with any enterprises for implementation of Arbitrum chain? Sure, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of conversations going on there. Um, and I think some enterprises are dipping their toes in the water. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, I'm probably the biggest company that's has had a public launch on Arbitrum. One of them may be Reddit. Oh, uh, Reddit did cool. a launch um, about a year ago now um, on the Arbitrum Nova chain mm -hmm. of uh, a tokenized version of their community point system. Mm -hmm. And well, since you have the ground of working in the government, do you plan to work with any governments uh, as well for implementation of some government services yeah. of the chain? So there have been some conversations along those lines. Um, there's been some experimentation from the government of Norway, mm -hmm. um, working on um, proto uh, sort of prototypes for um, uh, keeping their registry of corporate ownership mm -hmm. um, in an on-chain uh, database, uh, as an example. And there's some, there's some discussions going on about um, uh, about um, government currency projects and, mm -hmm. and some other things. And how do you see generally the sentiment on the market and from where do you see the biggest interest in uh, building uh, any projects, uh, any yeah. solutions on Arbitrum? Is it from uh, like builders, developers side, like for DeFi? Or yeah. how do you see generally adoption of enterprise? Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of uh, sort of bottom-up activity. Um, a lot of small teams, smaller teams or startup teams are, are trying to build things. Um, and um, most of the, or many of the major players in the Ethereum space have also come to Arbitrum. And that includes, say, centralized exchanges offering direct deposit or withdrawal, um, as well as uh, some of the, many of the most popular DeFi projects are there. Um, in the gaming space, we're a little we're a little bit earlier. There's you know there are special gaming chains, but I think we will see also um, specialized or sort of branded orbit chains for mm -hmm. uh, for some gaming companies as we go forward. And how do you support projects in your ecosystem? Do you have any ecosystem funds or so, mm, something yeah. like that? So Off Chain Labs does not, but the Arbitrum mm -hmm. Foundation uh, does have um, does have a grant program, mm -hmm. and. Um, which, uh, which they've been standing up. Um, and in addition, the Arbitrum DAO has a treasury and there's been movement toward creating a, a DAO funded and administered mm -hmm. grant program. Yeah, and you made quite a big splash with your airdrop of Arbitrum token. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when yes. everybody got super rich, so why did you decide to make such a generous airdrop? And how mm -hmm. does it influence the price of your token? Did you see yeah. like a lot of people dumping it? Well, so the, I mean, the decision to do the airdrop the way it was was really driven by by a desire to bring the community in, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you know, con sort of consistent with the philosophy we've had from the beginning, when the time came to move to community governance, right? We really wanted it to be community governance, um, and not uh, and not just pretend, um, and that meant that having community members be active, having, um, uh, uh, you know, 
making sure that the governance was broad and that um, the and that the votes in governance would go more broadly to the community. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it. Um, and I think that's what really motivated the structure of the, of the airdrop as much as anything. One thing that was um, innovative about the Arbitrum airdrop was that in addition to airdrop to individuals, there was also airdrop to, uh, to DAOs that had activity on the Arbitrum, Arbitrum 1 chain. So if a project was there on the chain, had been active, and had a DAO, then that DAO would get, itself would get an airdrop that would go to the DAO treasury. Okay, so it sounds like a grant, but uh, without any obligations. Right, it, I mean, it was an airdrop in that sense, that mm -hmm. it, right, it came without obligations. And the, and the hope was that um, this would allow those, um, those DAOs to participate in government, governance, or if they decided that they wanted to use it for their own purposes, they could do that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well, you're in the US, now we're in Asia, you travel yes. quite a lot, so yes. how do you see the differences of crypto adoption in uh, all these different regions? So some things are the same, I think, across regions. I think there's a certain kind of enthusiasm for crypto and for what it means okay. in terms of, for decentralizing mm -hmm. um, power and for empowering people to, to build things that they could not have built in the, in the legacy world. Um, so that much is common. But we do see, I think, different, well, you see different regulatory attitudes mm -hmm. toward crypto in different countries. You see as well, I think, different emphasis. So here in Korea, there's a lot of excitement around games. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a, in a sense, Korea is the home of online gaming. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you see a lot of focus on, um, on games. Some other places you see more social applications and others, DeFi is a bigger deal. And some of that has to do with law, some of it has to do with culture as well. Um, you know, there are some places where people are more, where ordinary people are more comfortable being involved directly in the financial system. Others want institutions to manage it for them. Um, yeah, so the other thing is there are of course unique and creative people in every place yeah. and one of the reasons to uh, one of the reasons to try to have uh, a worldwide community is simply to help find those people wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And what, in your opinion, is needed for the mass adoption of crypto? It's a, it's a few things. Uh, we need a better user experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important. And not only sort of the smoothness of advanced user interfaces, but also thinking carefully about how to protect people from errors and, um, uh, and things like that, mm -hmm. right? The, today's crypto infrastructure or today's crypto uh, tools are not very forgiving of error, right? If you mistype an address, yeah, sure. you, could send, um, you could send funds, send some asset mm -hmm. to, uh, to nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, at, for example. So we need, we need to make it safer and more comfortable for people. I think that's part of it. There's also, we need the technical infrastructure, the tools and the software that can operate at that large scale. Mm -hmm. Because if a billion people tried to use crypto tomorrow, we would not have the capacity for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we also need to build that out at the same time. I think those things are important. Um, and then of course, you know, to reach people, it means um, building awareness of crypto and, uh, uh, and education, getting people comfortable with the mm -hmm. idea. And can you share as well what's next for Auction Labs, for Arbitrum? Uh, sure. What's in your pipeline? Yeah. So for Offchain Labs, we're working on a bunch of things. We're really excited about Orbit Chains and, and helping to build out an ecosystem there. And what that means is making sure that the people who want to launch Orbit Chains are able to find infrastructure and, and other things that they need, making sure that they have choices in areas like data availability, they can configure their chain, they can, just, they can use whatever uh, economics they want on their chain, mm -hmm. and so on, and we want to make that really easy. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, for sure, uh, you know, we're continuing to do research to improve the core protocols. One of the areas that is going to be important is decentralizing the sequencing function, mm -hmm. um, and we're doing a lot of active work on that. Um, and we're continuing to try to drive the efficiency of the technologies, you know, making costs lower, making the scale larger. 
so you can do more at, at less cost. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, your expertise with us and hope to see more activity and more projects being built on Arbitrum. Great, yeah, we're open to anyone who wants to come and, and talk about building on Arbitrum. Yeah, thank you.